Good morning. We continue the Everybody Welcome uh, series, and today we look at you are all God's children. And our scripture is Galatians 3, uh, 26 through 29. If you used one of the older translations, um, you, you might kind of scratch your head and try to figure out what is the connection with children uh, out of it. Because um, the older translation just says sons, but the newer ones use the word children. And so listen to what Paul has written to the Galatian church. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. You are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. There was a, a radio preacher that uh, Victory Radio used to carry in the morning. It was J. Vernon. There were, there were two J. Vernons. One was J. Vernon McGee and the other one was J. Vernon Green. Uh, and I can't remember which one it was, but uh, he began his, his radio broadcast. Uh, he did uh, a commentary on the Bible and every five years that he would work his way through the whole Bible. But his opening uh, uh, spiel was this verse here, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. And I believe as he read it, uh, he said, for we are all one in Christ. <clears throat> Paul, in writing to the Galatian church, was under attack. Um, he was being attacked personally um, as to whether or not he was a true apostle. Uh, if you go back into Acts, you see that the definition of a, an apostle uh, had one ingredient that left Paul out, and that was that you had to have been among those 12, uh, among the, not the 12, but among that group that was um, with Christ uh, in his ministry, among that larger group than the 12 that were always there and um, experienced his teaching. And obviously that wasn't Paul. But Paul counters that with saying that, uh, that, that Christ had anointed him personally with his Damascus Road experience as defending his apostleship, something that uh, no one else could, could make that claim like Paul was making it. And his message was also under attack, uh, under attack by the Jewish religious leaders uh, who were trying to merge this uh, Christi Christianity, this Christian sect, into the Jewish uh, organization. They recognized that they couldn't put it out, and so they were attempting to uh, bring it into the fold um, to make it part of who, so that they had control over it. I mean, it was power, you know, plain and simple. And, and so they were saying that since Paul was preaching a freedom from the law, uh, and, and they were saying that the sin and, and the laws, um, keeping the law which avoided sin, um, was essential. And, and, and Paul's message was that uh, because of Christ, uh, the law, we have moved beyond the law. The law's purpose was to point out sin. Okay, now we all know what sin is, so let's move beyond that and let's talk about how we get into a right relationship with, with God. It is not the law. Uh, we, we proved that keeping the law is not going to, to uh, achieve that. Um, and then he talks about uh, all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And he's pulling up the image here, uh, two images. One is uh, very clear, the other is implied. But he's contrasting the baptism of a Jewish convert 
not not somebody who was born in the Jewish faith, but a, a, a convert who wants to convert to Judaism. Uh, there was a baptism for those people, and he's contrasting that with the Christian baptism. And under the Jewish baptism, um, there were there were three things. Um, you had to be circumcised, you had to offer a sacrifice, and you had to be baptized uh, to convert to the Jewish faith. And the baptism consisted of a ritual um, that uh, you had to cut your hair, and, and this is all uh, for the men. It, uh, I didn't find any reference about how women can convert to the, the Jewish faith. Um, but you had to cut your hair and your nails, fingernails and toenails, uh, you were stripped naked, uh, and you were immersed in water because uh, the ritual had that all parts of your body had to be touched by the water. Um, and, and while you were um, in the water, that um, there would be uh, parts of the law read to, to you and words of encouragement. Um, either while you were in the water or before, there had to be a confession of faith before three men, and these three men were called the fathers of baptism. Uh, I guess you could equate that to the, the elders in the church, that you had to make a confession of faith, not before the congregation, as practices in Christian, but, but to these three people. Uh, <clears throat> and you emerged as a member of the Jewish faith. In the early Christian baptism, uh, as it was practiced uh, probably in the time of Paul, but if not shortly after Paul, uh, there was a ritual. Uh, there was a period of preparation uh, <clears throat> that uh, went on for a year. Uh, baptisms occurred, uh, uh, this would have been right after the time of Paul, that baptisms occurred during the Easter celebration. There was an Easter vigil um, that went from sunset on Saturday until sunrise on Saturday mor Sunday morning. Uh, and during that time, as the, the congregation gathered, um, part of the ritual was to baptize the convert, con converts who had been prepared in a year-long instruction of the faith. And it wasn't just a year-long instruction of the faith. Uh, there was a test. You were questioned on your faith uh, prior to baptism by the elders of the church uh, so that you had to be able to articulate uh, your understanding of what it meant to be baptized. Um, you were stripped naked and, uh, and baptized in a pool of water. Uh, upon coming out, you were given a new uh, set of clothes uh, that were white and you went and, and uh, partake, partook in communion with the congregation. You became part of the congregation, a part of the, uh, uh, in the Catholic sense, a uh, part of Christians everywhere because you were one with Christ. Um, and Paul says because of this, that we are all the same, that there is no Jew or Gentile, or uh, the scripture says uh, Greek, but that's uh, Paul's in a Greek territory, so he's using uh, Greek there. Male or female, slave or free. In other words, there's no distinction in the body of Christ, that we are all one with Christ and part of the, the body. Um, William Barclay points out that there was a, a morning prayer that, uh, that Jews prayed in the morning. Uh, as part of their morning uh, ritual. Uh, and the words of that prayer were, Thou hast not made me a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Um, I just find it interesting that Paul uses those words, but he turns them around uh, on, on those that are attacking him uh, for his uh, preaching of the, the gospel. And he goes on in, in closing this out, uh, that you're all one in Christ Jesus. Now if, now if you all belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's descendant, 
heirs according to the promise. And the promise goes back to uh, Abraham and the promise that God made to Abraham in his faith uh, that Abraham and his descendants would always be God's people. And, and so this, in one way, is a slap in the face at, at the <coughs> Jews who consider themselves to be uh, the chosen people, that they, they're the special people uh, that God chose and set apart. And in the way Paul is putting it here, that, uh, that through faith, uh, actually it's two parts, through grace, God's love for humanity and his son, Jesus Christ, and our faith, which is our response to that uh, act of love of Christ, that we are one with God, we are right with God. Um, and as such, that those promises that, that God was making to Abraham, that we stand to inherit that um, alongside of Christ. And as the fourth chapter goes on, uh, Paul uh, uh, gets into more detail about that inheritance that we have um, and being adopted, as it, as it were, into uh, the body of Christ. Uh, under the uh, Roman adoption, um, your past ceased to exist, and you became the, the new person with your, your heritage, uh, your inheritance, and, and everything centered around the family that adopted you. You not only took their name, uh, you became one of theirs, the same as if you'd been born into that family. And, and that's what Paul says is happening here um, through our faith in Christ, that, that we become one in the body of Christ. Um, and I think that uh, Paul's use of the word children here, um, in my mind, that relates back to uh, to Jesus and his teaching that unless we come uh, to God as children, uh, children come with a faith and a trust that hasn't been corrupted by the world. And, and Paul's saying that, uh, or Jesus was saying that we need to come to God with that kind of uncorrupted faith. And I think Paul's use of the word children here um, points that, or, or points us in that direction, that uh, the, the, the very reason that God sent his son Jesus was because of the corruption of the religious leaders, how they had corrupted the faith. And, and so Jesus in pointing the way, and I think Paul's use of the word children here, points us back in that direction. <coughs> That that, uh, that that uncorrupted faith of a child, uh, that we somehow need to find that and and come to to God uh, with our faith in that uh, childlike faith, that, that complete trust. I'm rambling on here trying to find the right words, but but complete trust. That, just that, just like a family, a complete family, the children rely on the parents, give them food, shelter medical attention, uh, kiss my boo-boo when it hurts <laughs> and fall down and scrape an elbow or whatever. So they completely trust the parents or older siblings to help take care of them. And that's what God, the, uh, he said Paul to say, we have to deal with God in the same way, put the trust completely in him and he'll take care of any of our needs. I think that, that that complete trust, it just occurred to me while I was listening to you, Roger. Uh, in our practice of infant baptism in the United Methodist Church, I think that childlike trust, that complete trust and faith uh, is at work. <coughs> uh, obviously an infant uh, hasn't uh, formed at that time to, to trust other than they know the security of being with uh, the parent, the one who feeds them, uh, washes them, keeps them clean and safe. Uh, 
but there's that element of trust on the parents um, that, that uh, they have been entrusted with this life uh, to nurture it into the, to the faith and, and to uh, carry it on. There was another reference uh, that William Barclay made that uh, in the older translations it talks about tutor. Um, and <clears throat> there was within the, the, the uh, Greek uh, culture, um, there was a trusted slave within the household. Uh, generally, uh, one of the senior members of the household who had been around for a long time, and their job, uh, their sole job, was to see that the children were safely escorted to wherever their schooling was taking place. And then once they were finished for the day to escort them safely back, see them safely back into the household. Uh, and, and there's a, a you, you can see a relationship with their, uh, at least I do, with God's gift of Christ to us. Um, and Christ is our tutor. He's that one that ushers us uh, into the body of Christ, uh, ensures that we get there safely and, and totally uh, within the body. Well, as I told you, um, our service today is, is going to focus uh, more on children than, than um, I have done in this scripture. Um, uh, Carol will be bringing the message to us today. And so I invite you to make sure you don't miss that and that you are a part of our worship later on this morning. So may God's blessings be with you. <clears throat>